Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Church on the Green, located in New Haven, Connecticut. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are invited and welcome. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at United Church on the Green, please visit our website at unitednewhaven.org. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your possessions, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your God is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put back into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. God is still speaking to us. May our hearts be open to listen, learn, and grow.
choir, that was so beautiful. At my last church, I was actually in the choir, so I could never get up and say how beautiful the choir was. But my stepson, Brian, is in the choir, so I can be a little objective. Um, Jesus says, love your enemies. Who is my enemy? Most of us are familiar with the scripture question, who is my neighbor, in the Good Samaritan story. Today, I pose the question a little differently. Who is my enemy? Growing up in the 50s and 60s, during the Cold War, Russia was our clear enemy. I remember practicing hiding under our desks for bomb squares, bomb scares, drills. Then Russia wasn't our enemy anymore. Peter and I visited Russia. We went to St. Petersburg and we went on a cruise down 18 locks down to Moscow. And we talked to young people that, and then we talked to people that were our age and they said, you know, we also hid under our desks and had drills against USA. But we also had peace marches too, like you did in the USA and demonstrations. Well, maybe we are having our enemy again. And children still do practice hiding, but for very different reasons, mass shootings, etc. In the age of terrorism, our enemies are not so clear cut. And we argue about who may be our enemy, politically or personally. We may have personal enemies, or we ourselves may be our own worst enemy on some self-destructive behaviors. Enemies come and go. It seems to be our nature to have them. But Jesus says to love them. I love this children's book, and I was planning to read it whether we had children or not, <laughs> Enemy Pie by Derek Munson. I like it because it takes an interesting take on this question, who is my enemy? It takes into consideration our human need for revenge and yet opening up our eyes to transformation. I just lost my best enemy. I love that quote. Or some people say, fake it till you make it. Loving your enemy doesn't always change the other person, but it always changes you. Sometimes love does change us, because love is most appreciated when it is not deserved. This is the lectionary text for today, and the, the companion lectionary scriptures are the Genesis story of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Remember that beautiful play? It's a wonderful story of forgiveness. Joseph forgives his brothers for trying to kill him and leaving him for dead, even when he sees that God's hand was the very thing that, that saved him. I often wonder, however, if Joseph could be so forgiving if things had not turned out so well for him. God draws straight with crooked lines sometimes. Do you remember when they were working on the highway out here on the connector? I was driving down from Kensington for a doctor's appointment over at St. Raphael's and I got in the wrong lane. You know, they switched up the lane so you couldn't remember which way it was going and I was always already running a little late and I got so lost in New Haven trying to figure out where I was to get to the doctor's. And suddenly on the radio came this song, God draws straight with crooked lines. And suddenly I found the hospital. St. Raphael's turned up and I thought, wow, that was strange that that song should come up. God draws straight with crooked lines. So the times in our lives when it seems as though that the bad thing has happened to us, we realize that God draws straight with crooked lines that somehow God will get us there in his way. The same way he saved Joseph from what his brothers wanted to do to him. And Joseph forgave him. 
In human terms alone, forgiveness and loving our enemies can be extremely challenging. But sometimes God gives us the grace to do this impossible task. Because with God, nothing is impossible. I would like to mention how this scripture, like several others, have been used to oppress people in the past. Turn the other cheek has kept many women in abusive relationships, thinking that they are following the words of Jesus. But loving an enemy is an act of nonviolent protest, of turning the other cheek. It is an extremely different scenario than abuse. Your supposed loved one striking you, violence is never an action of a loved one. Besides Jesus' words today were meant for the disciples, not necessarily for our time and place. Though Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. have used turn the other cheek as a way for protests and nonviolent resistance. By loving one's enemies, we break the expected cycle of retribution. St. Paul says it like this in Romans. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I painted that and posted it over my office the week of 9-11 because we were so overcome with what we perceived as evil. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Loving in the face of evil. Have you read the book or seen the movie Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Ingle? There's a scene there where she's loving, loving, loving in the face of evil, and it finally conquers him. Loving in the face of evil. Or you might put it this way. My grandma Myers used to say, Olivia, two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. It's taken me a long time to really understand what she meant by that. Or there was a song I heard once in seminary. When will you realize the one that you despise is precious in the eyes of Jesus? When will you realize the one that you despise is precious in the eyes of Jesus? That one really got me especially thinking about the people I despise right now in my life. <laughs> Sometimes, when grace is strong in us, we can be conduits for God's love. Sometimes I love the bumper sticker, best of all, that says, God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> We can be conduits for God's love, mercy, and compassion. There is a wideness in God's mercy much larger than anything we can conjure up. Jesus says we must love our enemies, but he doesn't say we have to like them. <laughs> That's a little salvation for us. So are we in this for the reward? At the end of the scripture that Catherine read, it says that God will fill your pockets. If you do these things, God will fill your pockets. And I, can't, I have to confess that sometimes when I'm doing a good deed, I think to myself, boy, I must be racking up points for heaven. I must be racking them up here. Maybe sometimes we start out that way, that we're doing this just for our reward, even in, in this world or the long-term future reward. Maybe it starts out with that, but forgiveness is often its own gift. Amazing grace. Once I was blind, but now I see. I don't know how I got here, but I'm mighty grateful. I don't know what changed me, but I'm mighty grateful. What changes us is a grace greater than our sin, greater than our best intentions, and even our hard work. Jesus models in word and deed the compassion 
of a loving God for all people. When the Good Samaritan saw the wounded man on the road, he knew that that was his enemy. That was a man he was supposed to be hating and who hated him. But that didn't stop him. <laughs> Jesus said, who proved neighbor in this case? But I said, that was his enemy and he loved him. He loved him. Maybe he didn't like him. Their families had been fighting for centuries. But he loved him. And he lost his best enemy that day. Like the little boy in the story, we hold resentments. And we would like the enemy pie to be the, like the one in the help. Have you seen the, one, the movie The Help? Right away I thought of that when I heard about enemy pie. And those of you who've seen the movie know that. That's not what I mean by enemy pie, but there are times in our lives when we'd like to serve it up to somebody. But it's not like that. When we really forgive people, we're like the little boy in the story, we've suddenly changed your mind and we don't want them to eat the pie. I do believe it takes a lot of courage to live the Christian life. The root word of courage is core or heart. A lot of heart, a lot of love. But we are easily distracted by the evils of the world. The other reading for the lectionary today, in addition to the Joseph story, is Psalm 37. And it said, do not fret because of the wicked. It leads only to evil. And I have to confess, I have been fretting about the works of evil in the world today. How about you? We've been fretting. We've been fretting. But Psalm 37, trust in the Lord. He will take care of it. If you hate the evil more than you love the good, you just become a darn good hater. <laughs> you just become a darn good hater. And, and you know, that's what I needed to hear. You know, ministers go into the ministry mostly to hear the sermons for themselves. And I needed to hear this, to love your enemies, fret not the wicked, even though they seem like they're doing well. Fret not the weak, wicked, trust in the Lord. There is a Hasidic story of a man that stands on the green and screams for people to change and convert and change their ways. But no one ever does. People stop and listen, but nobody changes. Finally, a group of people from the town came to him and said, Sir, why do you stand here and shout for people to change and be more loving? Why do you do this day after day when, you, when nobody's changing? And he said, well, in the beginning, I did do it to hope to change them. Now I do it so they can't change me. Now I do it so they can't change me. And that's what I think that Jesus was giving this little hint to his disciples. He said, love your enemies because it's the only way to conquer them. Love your enemies. Do not judge. Well, forgiveness, especially when it is not deserved, is a tough pill to swallow. And every enemy cannot be changed by a play date, like our story. But the root word of forgiveness is untie. And the other children's sermon that I like to give on this scripture is I bring in a sneaker that has all kinds of knots on it. And I say to the kids, do you want to help me uh, untie this knot? Or should I just throw the sneakers away or cut the laces? And they said to me, well, Reverend Olivia, just get Velcro sneakers. <laughs> so I stopped using that as a children's sermon. But I thought about it in another way. If you ever, women, have you ever gotten a necklace all tangled up that you wanted to wear and, and the, it's time to go and your necklace is in a ball and, and, and I, you know, you can't throw the necklace out, you know? So forgiveness is like that. It requires patience. So I give it to my husband. <laughs> and he unties it for me because he has the patience that I don't have 
to get it back on me. And forgiveness is like that. You can't expect it to happen right away. And if you force yourself to do it, you just make the knot worse. And you don't want to throw away the necklace. You don't want to throw away the necklace. Forgiveness is like that. Jesus has really given it to the disciples. He's talking about, you know, people ask you to give, you've got to give more, you've got to go the second mile, you know, you have to do all these things. Then he gets to the part, Jesus says, judge not that you be judged. And I'm like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I'm not judgmental about anything. I'm in this liberal church and I, I'm not judgmental. The only thing I'm judgmental about is judgmental people. <laughs> I'm very judgmental about judgmental people. So Jesus said, be not judged, at least you be judged. Somehow I think that my condemnation will change them. But I realize, no, only love changes. And not only my personal love, but a greater love, a perfect love. Because perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love can change us. So I ask you today, who is your enemy? Can you visualize loving them? Do you even want to visualize loving them? Maybe today you could take a baby step and just pretend you visualize loving them. <laughs> Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I believe that our whole lives are one long apprenticeship in love to the master of love, Jesus Christ. And with the grace of God, we hopefully get a little better at it every day. But like the ancient Christian dance, sometimes it's three steps forward and one step back. Three steps forward and one step back. May the grace of God touch us all today to be able to love our enemies and change the world.